Hello, this is Dr. Mewborn, and this is Christology. We're in Lesson 6, and we're looking at the eternal work of Christ Jesus. It's good to be with you today. Let's go ahead and jump into our study. We've seen the slide before, and we're talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, we know every attribute related to God the Father is equally related to the Son. Only in their personal properties can a person truly distinguish the persons of the Trinity. The early church fathers made it known, three persons and yet one God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, possessing all divine attributes, but are very different in their functions. And that's important to know as we jump into the eternal work of Christ Jesus, because Jesus Christ was with the Father, the Holy Spirit, at the beginning. We can see this from Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's important to see that first uh, focus of the word Elohim, which means God created, the strong version of God. And it's telling us in the plural form there that the Trinity was present in that moment. Also, when we see later on, when man is created, the Bible says, let us make man in our image. Let us, referring to the Trinity as well. And we see that uh, is what's going on in eternity past, how Christ is eternal, and there's work that he has done that's eternal as well. But as we look at this, I wanted to show you also a wrong view of the Trinity. We're looking at the words modalism and Sabellianism. Both of these words refer to the same thing when talking about the Trinity, and this is actually the opposite of the Trinity. It's a denial of the Trinity. It states that God is a single person who, throughout biblical history, has revealed himself in three modes or forms. God is a single person who first manifested himself in the mode of the Father in the Old Testament times. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit never all exist at the same time. There's some teaching out there that comes from this, and one of the people that um, championed this for a while, and and it's hard because he's been questioned on a few times, is Bishop T.D. T. D. Jakes, and um, he pastors a church called the Potter's House. He also has made movies, um, but he has been a person that's known to be a modalist. Now, it's interesting that he's gone back and forth with this, and so he's, he would say that he is a Trinitarian, or he believes in the Trinity at times, but then the way he says things seems a little bit different, and so um, we can't always nail this down, but he's a person that's been noted as being a modalist in the past, and it's just important to know what the differences it are more than who's really doing it, because some people are definitely teaching that. Um, but as we go back to the eternal work of Christ, we're talking about things that we mentioned before. The eternal work of Christ is unique because it's Christ working to do things, uh, which started in the eternity past, continue on, kind of above time type of actions, and then of course, on into e everlasting life. But um, we see that power to forgive sins, power over heaven and earth, power over nature, power of sin and death, power to give eternal life, um, and power to impute righteousness. So as Jesus is the creator and sustainer of life, he is the one behind the scenes keeping everything going at the same time. And only for a temporary period of time, which was which was during his time on the earth, was he limited in some of these actions. It's not that he was not all powerful in the earth, it's that he limited himself. That's what we talked about with kenosis, where he emptied himself of many things. We know that he never emptied himself of his deity. He never emptied himself of who he was or um, totally uh, what his nature is. He never did that. But what we do see is he limited himself from um, his knowledge as well as his worship that he was receiving in heaven, as well as the glory that he was receiving and the beauty that he was within. And so very unique to see this eternal work. Uh, I showed you that um comic as well, which I think is just wonderful. All right, well, let me show you some verses now that will help you to see a little bit more about how God has worked in eternity, or um, his eternal work is clearly seen. We can start out in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us 
for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. I want you to focus in on a couple of things here. The mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. So in eternity past, God had a plan. God had a plan to set forth his mystery and to make that known, which he did that starting with the person of Jesus Christ. And of course, he went through the apostles. And then we get to the apostle Paul, especially, and he reveals this mystery to the people, especially in Ephesians chapter three and makes known what he's doing. But what's happening here is he's saying that I have a purpose and I have a will for all those who are in Christ Jesus. That's when you see this prepositional phrase, in him we have these things. In him, we have um, adoption. In him, we have um, redemption. We have forgiveness, forgiveness of trespasses. He lavishes us with his grace. That's what we see, receive in him. And I think this is unique in Ephesians chapter 1 because when you see these verses 3 through 10, it helps you to understand maybe one side of things because who is Paul speaking of here? Well, you don't fully know until you read the next part. Verse 11, it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, which he is the wonderful counselor. We talked about that in Isaiah chapter 9. Um, verse 12, So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Now, here's a change. This is a turn. This is a different focus. Look with me in verse 13. In him, so we've been talking about a, another group of people in him. Now we're talking about somebody else. It says, in him, you also. So the recipients of this letter to the Ephesians, which were Greeks, Gentiles, says, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So what he's saying here is that you Gentiles who are getting this letter, you heard the word of tr truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed, and then you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And he's saying this about them because this is very unique to them. This is a gospel that was to the Jew first. Now it's coming to the Gentile and he's telling them, and he's splitting this off and he's saying, hey, listen, you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You believed in it. And now God has sealed you. And so you are going to get what we already have because we have obtained an inheritance. That's what it says in verse 11. So he's talking about himself and I believe probably Jews as well. And he's saying there, have been, having been predestined according to the promise of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So we had purposes with the Jews, huge purposes. And then he says to these Gentiles in verse 13, you, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now he's changing who he's talking about. It's a wonderful passage here because verse 13 and 14 really speak to uh, the idea of salvation. How were these Gentiles, how did the Gentiles come into the faith? And they came in this way. They heard the word of truth. They heard the gospel of salvation. They believed. Then they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And then they were given a guarantee of an inheritance that they get, which is also for the Jew and the Gentile. You see it played out even more clearly in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Uh, it says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to 
to the sons of men and other generations as it's now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is, here it is, the, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So what is he talking about? The mystery of Christ? And then he explains it. The mystery is this, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So that's what we're talking about. He was saying all the Jews are receiving their inheritance, but all those who believe that are Gentile, hear the gospel, believe they come in as well. Continuing on in Ephesians chapter 3, it says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though, I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach the, God, the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to the light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might not might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have a boldness and access with a confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. He's saying, verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is he talking about? He's talking about the mystery of Christ. And he's saying this was according to his purpose that the Jews and the Gentiles would receive receive they'd be fellow heirs with one another partakers of the same inheritance that god has amazing passage all right so let's continue on with the eternal work of christ second timothy 1 9 says this therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our lord nor of me as prisoner but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of god who saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in christ jesus before the ages began. What did he give us? He gave us Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, you have salvation. Before you're in Christ Jesus, you're an enemy. You're alienated from God. You are separated from God. You are a child of wrath. But in Christ Jesus, you are given all the good things and all the purposes and all the things that Christ has accomplished for you. And you see that in that passage. Revelation 13, 8 says, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the Lamb, uh, book of life of the Lamb who was slain. We're talking about the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. What does that mean? What are we talking about here? I think Ken Ham, who was one of the speakers at, um, at Mid America um, in 2000, in the fall of 2018, uh, he gave us some great understanding of, of who Christ is, but he also wrote this article and was very helpful in, for us to understand um, this great passage. He says, think about this. Before the universe was created, before time existed, before man was created, God knew that we in Adam would sin. He knew we would rebel against our creator. And in the wisdom and love of God in eternity, he predetermined a plan so that we could receive a free gift of salvation. In eternity, God planned for the Son of God to step into history to provide the ultimate sacrifice. The sinless Son of God would suffer sin's penalty of death, be raised from the dead, thus providing a way of salvation. Hebrews 10.10 10 declares, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. He wrote an article called Slain from the Foundation of the World along with this. And, um, and I think it's great uh, that, that he made some points here. He gives an A, B, C, and D uh, point to this. He said this, when God created the heavenly bodies on day four of creation for signs and for seasons and for days and for years, Genesis 1.14, he knew that one of those signs would be for the time the Son of God would become a man born of a virgin in a town called Bethlehem. B. 
when God made the trees and all plants and all the and on the third day of creation, Genesis 1:11, he knew that a tree would one day be used for the most evil event in history, when evil men would crucify the Son of God. And yet, by God's foreknowledge and predetermined plan, this event would occur for the salvation of souls. He goes on to say, when God made the land animals on day six, just as 124, he knew that he would soon sacrifice at least one of those animals because of the because of our sin in Adam. And he knew he had predetermined that this would one day happen to the Son of God so we could receive the free gift of salvation. Indeed, when God cursed the ground and caused thorns and thistles to grow because of sin, Genesis 3.18, contemplate the fact that God knew that one day thorns would be used to pierce the brow of his Son as he hung on the tree paying the penalty for our sin. And they clothed them with purple, plaited a ground, a crown of thorns, and put it about his head. In Mark 15, 17. I love these um, bullet points that he gives us because it's helping us to see God had an incredible eternal plan from the beginning that would bring salvation to hurting, suffering, um, people dying without Christ. He was, he was going to, uh, he was giving them eternal life. Wonderful, amazing gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ um, became sin so that God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Good to be with you today. Um, so want to so excited to be studying this topic with you. Pray you have a wonderful rest of the day. God bless you. Bye-bye.